Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Don and Will, for having me here. And before we begin our Dharma talk, I'd like us to recite a very simple mantra called Om Nam, which is the universe in its purity, seven times. Om Thank you very much. It's been wonderful to hear that this group uh, had been gathering here for nearly five years. Congratulations. This is a wonderful and consistent effort to grasp the Dharma and thus attain who we truly are. Zen means not just understanding ourself, but attaining our true nature. You can get a lot of understanding by good readings, good sutras, good Zen books. But if you have to make one more step, then you need to leave behind all the written word and enter what we call the practicing path. How do we do that? It's not just the meditation technique that we need. It's the correct view that we need that leads us from the words to the source of the words from pure sensations to the sensor that senses everything that we see, hear, taste, smell, touch, think, feel, and say and do. So what is it that says your name inside? What is it that is happy or sad? What is it that is totally overjoyed and next day, absolutely depressed. What is it inside of you that says, me? For millennia, humankind has been walking around these issues and created religions, spiritual paths. But one that it was called in India, jhana, meant that you actually experience that, not only think about that. Do not just listen to explanations, Go to the very source, the very mind that produced those insights. Jhana literally means absorption, oneness, a state of clarity, perceiving the true nature of phenomena. And as this teaching traveled to China, Jhana became Channa. Then, as you know, Chinese like to make things short and quick. So Channa became Chan. And the same Chinese character reads as Son in Korean and Zen in Japanese. So all these variations really mean meditate, come back to one mind, come back to undifferentiated energy. Thus you attain what we call clear like space they're like mirror consciousness. But originally, our true nature has no name and no form. So no matter how much you think about it, you cannot get it by thinking. I would like to demonstrate the path with the help of a circle. It's called the Zen Circle, devised by Zen Master Sung San, my late teacher. And you can find this in this booklet called Compass of Zen. Imagine a circle with five distinct points. 
0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, and 360 degrees. At 0 degrees are those people who have no questions. I mean no real questions. Only expectations. And if those expectations are fulfilled, then they're happy. If they are unfulfilled, then these people just become frustrated and angry and start to blame other people or the, or the world for their misfortune. When you begin to ask your first real question, that means your attention changes, your energy turns somewhere else, the direction is somehow not so externalized and ridden with illusions, then you become suitable for studying, just studying. That means you passed to one degree, then you become more honest with yourself and you're asking better and better questions. Therefore, you are getting better and better answers. Then your studies can take you up to 90 degrees. That's when your intellectual knowledge is sufficient. That's when your map is clear. All the objects on the map are in place. You could start actually the exploration. You could start meditation practice. With many of us, especially the clever ones, we do not realize how insufficient cleverness is. Sometimes we are lost in our bright and brilliant ideas or those of others. And we keep going in circles between 0 and 90, believing that if we just master the word, we actually master the mind. This is not true. No matter how much candy you eat, if you don't go to the candy factory, you will never know how that candy is made. So before long, we realize that, okay, no matter how much I know, I haven't attained anything. And that's when we embark on the path of experience. Zen means we perceive directly our karma, so that we could attain our true nature in its entirety, without filters, without interpreters, without symbols, without systems, without constraints of logic. And then we practice and we are very simple with our meditation techniques. It's enough to ask this question, what is this? With every in-breath and let everything go at the out-breath and keep your body steady and keep your mind present. This brings you to spiritual maturity. This gives you insight of who you truly are instead of what you think you are. And if you can endure that, then you can come to the highest point of attainment, which is signified by 180 degrees. This is the top of the Zen circle. And in many words, you can designate that. You can designate that as awakening or enlightenment or oneness. But originally, it has no name, no form, no thinking, therefore no I, or any duality is coming from your eye. So if I want to demonstrate that, I would not use any words. When you hear the sound, there is no thinking. Maybe after that, there is thinking. Yeah, the glass is broken. <laughs> we'll make it up to you. Then, as your experience deepens, then you start to use this attainment to transform your karma. And then you realize, since all karma is impermanent, imperfect, and interdependent, you can change anything in your mind. There's no more absolute identity. There's no more absolute karma. There's no more absolute good and bad in your heart. So that means even the heaviest load can be lifted. Even the worst crime can be forgiven. Even the highest of attainment is impermanent. So then you start to do your homework because you got the right tool for it. And that's your clarity, your insight, your capability to see things as they are, see yourself and other people as they are. Where is your vulnerability? 
your vulnerability totally overlaps with your ignorance. Wherever you don't see, you have a blind spot. And that blind spot can be exploited. Reverse the equation, and if you see yourself exploited, or something, someone hit you, that was your blind spot. You were not prepared. You were not aware. You had willful or unwillful ignorance, but you had ignorance there. And ignorance is the lack of insight. In Sanskrit, it's called avidya, not seeing. Vidya is seeing. That's what the Buddha taught. Take away avidya and perceive clearly. So, as you approach 270, you see that everything's possible. Nothing is absolutely firm. We have statistical probabilities and not absolute truths. We have clear observations, but not an, a universe set in immovable stone. So, relativity is something that the West had to invent through science. See the path we traveled from Galileo Galilei to Einstein, it's more than 300 years. What did we have to change in our minds to approach reality correctly? Because Western religions really tied and bound the mind to absolute truths. And sometimes you had to believe those words instead of your own eyes and ears and logic. And that's why it had to be said in the West, not in the East, that yet it moves. E pur si move in Latin. That's the last words that Galilei ever spoke. Then came Einstein and everything, even time and space, became relative. So are the phenomena of your mind. So is all of your karma. See how this karma is created, maintained, and taken away. If your mind is clear, if you have attainment, you can do that. If you have no attainment, you can have good thinking, but it will be partial. It doesn't take you all the way. And what is it that has to take you all the way? Something beyond life and death. Something as profound and simple and clear as your enlightened true nature. Nothing else will suffice, because when you lose this body, you cannot think, you cannot feel, you cannot see, you cannot hear, you cannot touch, you cannot smell. All of these anchors for the mind is gone. What then? And do not subscribe for just somebody else's words. Zen means that you do not depend on the word. You depend on your own experience. The word is as good as the map which leads you to the landscape, but then you have to walk the walk and stop the talk. And then you have your own insight. That's your own strength. That's your own spiritual autonomy. And that takes you beyond life and death. So at 270 degrees, you realize that you can transform anything and everything. You can change your karma, you can change your views, you can forgive, you can forget whichever you want. But what is it that directs this? Why would I be the magician of all times? Why? And at 270 degrees, on top of this capability, you realize if you just do this for yourself, you are still limited. No matter how great this I is, if it doesn't become something, someone that serves a higher purpose, then it's useless. So that's when the Bodhisattva appears. I practice for you. I change this karma for you. I offer the path to you. So that's when we start to practice and live for all beings. It doesn't mean you have to lose your private property. It means that you open your life because you have opened your heart. It means that generosity naturally appears and you are free to take or give because that freedom has been earned and attained. And at 360 degrees, the circle finishes and vanishes because it has served its purpose. That's what we call Bodhisattva life. Practicing for the enlightenment and awakening of others. Why? Because as one great teacher has said, awakening is the solution. 
Have you ever asked yourself, especially if you look at history, why do we keep repeating our mistakes as a society, as a civilization, as a human culture, as families, you look at your own lineage, generation after generation, we walk into the same patterns, we repeat the same mistakes and merits, and we can't get out of that zone. Why? We never went beyond. We never had the higher view. We never had the transcendental wisdom to actually change ourselves and therefore the world. Because if you do not change yourself, if we do not change ourselves, how do we expect to change the world? So in Rome, they said, Ate in Tsipi, begin with yourself. And this was not a Zen teacher, this was Horatio. So if we practice, we can change ourselves. That means we change the world around us. But no matter how we strive and try, if we just want to make some external changes in the world, they will be easy to reverse because we haven't made something fundamental. We haven't changed ourselves. So be the change you want to live. And that's why we are practicing. And the awakened mind, the highest quality that human beings can attain on this earth is the solution. More and more awakened societies produce less anger, greed, and ignorance. Consequently, if you see a society producing a lot of greed, anger, and ignorance, that is the further and further from enlightenment. Okay? Seeing your smiles and looking into your eyes, I believe the time is right for questions. Please. You talked about awakening. Is it possible in this existence to become awakened? And have you ever met anyone who's been awakened? Or what color is this wall? Uh, I, I believe it's white. <laughs> if it's white, then your eyes are clear. What do you hear right now? Uh, your voice. No, silence. Almost there. You see, you're more distracted with what you hear. What you see is pretty steady. So when all the channels of eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body and mind, all clear and constantly clear, that's the basic state of awakening. You can go further, but for most of us, this would be enough. Seeing clearly, hearing clearly, and thinking and feeling and speaking and acting clearly, that would be plenty. So let's stick with that. If you return to the mind before thinking, we call that don't know mind then it becomes clear like space, clear like a mirror. So that's awakening enough. So never lose your eyes, never lose your ears. The gentleman here. Yeah. How does all of this fit into the reincarnation process from birth to what we know now as, as, as individuals? Is there, is there a transference of, of energy during the reincarnation process? What did you bring here when you were born? Nothing. Not correct. I ask you a different way. Okay. Why did you take this body and not the neighboring son's body? Well, during the reincarnation process, my understanding is that you as an individual or, or a mind at the time, you s s select how to reincarnate uh, into this universe who your parents would be, what lessons you need to learn that you've missed on, on, prior, on prior lifetimes. So how does the art of Zen follow, follow in, in through that process, or is it all interconnected? Zen includes the teaching of reincarnation. But if we only have explanations about it, and we don't make it our own experience, what is it that reincarnates, then these explanations remain external. And in the most precious time, when we die and when we are born, we can't use them. They are 8,000 miles away. What is the body without the soul? A corpse. So when you wake up from your dream in the morning, sometimes you feel that the body is a little cold, a little stiff, Every one of us has lived long enough to experience that. So if you attain what comes back to the body from the dream, 
then you know what it is that passes on when there's no more chance to return to the body. If you read Zen books, of course you find similar explanations to yours, that whatever karma you make in this lifetime will actually make you choose the next incarnation's time, place and environment. And that is actually correct. But knowing this actually doesn't help you. It's better than not knowing it. But a few more steps are necessary. Attain that which reincarnates. Tang Dynasty Zen master Pai Chang, he wrote our temple rules. And he wrote many poems to encourage people to actually keep those rules in the right way. And one of his poems ends like this. If you die tomorrow, what kind of body will you get? Isn't that the most important issue for your mind? Hurry, hurry. Clouds float up to the heavens. Water flows down to the sea. Uh, what, what meditation practices do you do personally? And are, are they the same as, as your Korean uh, school practices? What I'm doing is not so important. As long as I can give you some value, my meditation practice is serving its purpose. And the value for you is not just sit, you know? Many people do sitting practice, and I believe you do that regularly too. Maybe not every day, but more or less regularly. When you sit, when you stand, when you walk, when you lie down, constantly keep this question, what is this? At first it might seem a little boring, if you're attached to the words, it becomes boring in 30 minutes. But if you see where the question points, it becomes first just a spotlight, then a larger diameter of light, then you have increased observation, and then it goes beyond the physical observation, because you kept the question steady. It's like a drill bit that can go through even six inches of steel if you keep it steady, not too fast, not too slow, and it goes through your karma and it reaches our substance. So keep the question. No need for mantras, no need for anything else for you. Watch your breath, watch your posture, keep the question, and single-mindedly just observe this moment. That's all. And that will work. And that makes you act clearly, speak clearly, think and feel clearly moment to moment. If not, you pull the drill bit back a little bit, cool it down, then try again. Okay, we make many mistakes in our meditation practice. Don't think it's like a blender that you read the user's manual, have the knobs, put in the fruit, and that's it, you have the smoothie that you need. Meditation is not like that. It's a trial and error process rather than learning, you know, something, and then you're done. Okay, so keep trying. I have a three and a half year old grandson. Fantastic. I know, and I've What's already- What's his name? Titan. Titan. <laughs> and I've already started uh, showing him a little bit about how to breathe when he's in the car seat and he can't get away from me. So I'm driving and, and I, I talk a little bit about his breath. Okay. But I wondered if, there's, if you have any ideas for of what course. I can be teaching him now. Okay. So first and foremost, we teach Zen to kids by simple games, instrumental games, or very simple instructions, and then they can see cause and effect right away, but we don't teach the kind of big stuff. Why? It would just go above their heads. They would not understand it. They would feel it as a nuisance. Mommy, give me some candy. Don't talk to me. I'm, I don't understand. So, but you can plant some seeds before they become adolescents and you will never see them again because they're just off to parties and school and friends and travels and you know whatever. So make them watch their breath. This is good, but also make, teach Titan to observe the belly, to observe the navel area. So two inches beneath our belly button, we have this thing called Tantian. And this Tantian is the place where you're energy and your consciousness are undifferentiated. It's the place of oneness. So if you teach kids to observe their belly before they blurt out something, or they go into some panic, or they have some dualistic reaction to anything, they can be taught. 
It's laborious. It doesn't go all at once, but it works. So the next thing you can do is the kind of non-dualistic reaction to Titan's little rantings. Okay? Because children, when they don't get something they want, they get so hyper, so quick. They get frustrated and they frustrate you back because you didn't give them what they wanted. So what you can do is actually refer to his deeper self as Titan. And then you can say, you know, Titans don't scream like that. Titans are really quiet. And if you want to control yourself, just watch your breath and your belly. You don't have to say these things. It doesn't make things any better or faster. If you want patience, then you watch your breath and your belly. Something better will appear. Better words will appear. And then you can use this skillful means, a little bit like Santa Claus, okay? But it has some experiential grounding, which means he can do it. He doesn't just have to believe it. He can do it. He can attain it. And you will hear him say, the appropriate moment, months or even years later, Mom, didn't you watch your Tantian? What have you just said? <laughs> when you hear that back, your mission is complete, at least stage one. Then you can get to stage two. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions? Yeah. Hi. Is it possible to reach a state of mind where you perceive no opposites? <clears throat> is that enlightenment? If I say yes, it's a mistake. If I say no, it's also a mistake. How would you answer your own question? I don't know. Good. Already there. <laughs> when this dono really begins to function, it really gives you reflections like a mirror. That's no opposites. The sky is blue, trees are green, all is white. Stick is brown. That's no opposites. Use your don't know. Okay. Good. More questions? I'd like to know if there are any teachings specific to food. When you're hungry, eat. <laughs> when you're I'm... not hungry, don't eat. <laughs> what else? Have you had dinner? Because after this, it's too late. <laughs> Then only a snack, little refreshment, and go to sleep. <laughs> Eating too late disturbs your sleep. We have general advice over the lines of non-harming. So do not harm living beings as much as possible to ensure your daily nutrients. If you have to kill or have to use somebody killing the animals for you, then use as low level consciousness as possible. So re related to that, eat when we're hungry. We don't normally, as ordinary people, eat yeah. when we're hungry. Yeah. We eat for all kinds of reasons, yeah. but not because of hunger. So how do we know the difference? You ask yourself when you eat, what is it that's eating in me? You will have very good answers. Sometimes we eat because of stress, because of anger, because of desire, because of all kinds of stuff. And sometimes our whole being cannot take the food, but still we shove it in because the mind wants to have it. And when you feel that your eating is misplaced, A, do not judge yourself. B, do not judge the food. C, ask the right question. And when you ask the right question, what is this that's eating right now? Then keep your mind open and clear and endure the answer. Because the answer can be a terrible blow to your self-image. And it will be. And then that changes you. Suddenly some karma is released. It cannot lurk anymore in the shadows, in the background. Because it became conscious. It bec you became aware of it. And then you can let go of it. Not before. Okay? Regarding eating. Um... One reason for eating that I find is boredom. I think a lot of people eat because they're bored. <laughs> How about you? Well, is, is there anything wrong with that? I mean, I'm, I'm bored. Hey, let me get an apple here. Or uh, Bored see. and hungry together, that's okay. Bored and not hungry, soon the person will have problems. If you're bored, try to help someone. It's very exciting. <laughs> Try to help somebody. Exactly. 
Okay. Right. When you eat, it's very predictable what's going to happen. When you help someone, it's a totally open-ended game. You don't know what's going to happen. So it's much more exciting. Mm. During the uh, opening statement about you, you had mentioned that, there's, that you're opening a facility or you have opened up a, a new facility just a short distance from here. Assuming any of us here would like to attend or participate, how does, how does that work? My good Dharma friend, Will Rauschenberger, operates a place called Ordinary Zen Sangha, not far from here. Uh, it's not me who has opened it, I'm just a guest, and I feel very much honored as a guest and grateful that I could enter that Dharma space. So if anybody wishes to visit that, please turn to Will for specifics. More questions? Can you talk about the concept of oneness? You talked about starting with yourself, but how does one move beyond oneself? <laughs> when you have no thinking, you have what we call one mind. I can't explain it to you. I shouldn't. But I bring you to the edge of the experience. When your mind hits without the stick hitting the table, you can sustain this one mind. No matter how much we think about it, our own thinking chops it up into concepts. And that's why in the old days they said, silence is better than holiness. Also in the Bible you can read, be still and know that I am God. There is a problem with that translation, the I is a problem. So it's a homework, what kind of I can we speak about in this sentence? It's a question that you may want to answer for yourself. The stillness is something we can keep with. So when you return before thinking, you spontaneously attain one mind. That's what this hit helped you and all of us for one fleeting moment. But after that, it's gone. If we don't meditate, we cannot re-attain it. Okay? So this one mind, when you attain it and you make it last, then it begins to operate like a mirror. Originally, it's clear like space, clear like a mirror. No more attributes. That's it. The rest is function. You see yourself. You see the other person. You perceive very precisely. All the channels of our personalities, eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, mind, feelings, thoughts, actions, speech, all of this appears in this mirror. Why is it worth doing this? Because when we are in a critical situation, when we are really pressed against the wall, our minds become very tight. Tighter and tighter, and then the problem becomes bigger than what we can hold. That's when we are in a state of shock. We can break. We can go berserk. And when that happens, you know that the mirror is either broken, or your mind space is too small to contain the problem itself. That's when we say we had no choice. We always have a choice, if we care to recognize it. How can we recognize it? That we have a larger mind space than the karma in it. We have bigger tolerance than the problems that we face. And for that, this kind of practice, this one mind, clear mind practice, is very necessary. Originally, your mind mirror is infinite in time and space. And your karma is finite, fortunately. Otherwise, we couldn't take it away. Your karma has a beginning and an end. Your true nature has no beginning, no end. So if you keep your mind really, truly, in its original state, there is no karma that can tie and bind you. There is no sensation that you couldn't reflect. There is no thought or feeling that you would forcibly identify with. Because your mirror is strong and clear. Then you can handle any kind of problem, gain or loss, high or low, along the lines of good or bad. Okay? That's why we practice one mind. Go ahead. Have you ever had the opportunity to, to meet the Dalai Lama? I met him twice, shook his hands, and I'm still here sitting right in front of you, so... Okay. He's actually a great man, I have to say that. 
But meeting him or not meeting him actually doesn't really define anything on your spiritual path unless you are a Tibetan Buddhist. If you are a Tibetan Buddhist, you join that lineage, whether it's Gelug or Karma Kaju or Nyingma or Shakyapa, then you have a deeper connection with him. And people have to be very respectful. Anybody has to be very respectful. But if you're part of the Tibetan uh, you know, Buddhist lineage, then he becomes way more for you. You are in his big family, okay? That, that would change everything. Is karma always bad? No, <laughs> especially when you smile at me like that. How can <laughs> karma be bad? Oh, thank you, sweetie. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we should talk more. <laughs> so, we need to have a clear understanding what karma is, then it stops being good or bad, then we can truly smile at each other when we do that, okay? So, karma, ladies and gentlemen, comes from the Sanskrit root word kr, which means action. So, karma means action and its result. <coughs> or cause and effect. Not just through physical action, but also through speech, emotions and thoughts and all the physical channels that I have mentioned before. So, emotion followed by emotion, cause and effect. Thought followed by another thought, cause and effect. Action followed by another action. Word followed by another word. Then the accumulation of these instances of cause and effect become habits. You repeat something, you learn it, it becomes second nature, it becomes a habit. But all these habits are made up of quanta, of cause and effect. That's why you can change them. That's why they are not immutable or absolute. The accumulation of cause and effect thus becomes habits. Habits become personality traits. These traits become your personality, who you believe you are as an avatar. These personalities join together and become couples and families and thus make group karma together. Don't think it stops with the individual. Then this group karma expands and it has the mindset of larger and larger groups, thus becomes a country or a nation or a continent or a civilization. And ultimately we have the group karma of human beings, the mental and physical output of 7.3 billion Homo sapiens and counting. So, if we perceive this karma, we can change it, we can use it. Remember the Zen circle. If we do not perceive this karma, this karma uses us. Your habits exploit you because you build them up, you became ignorant, you became a robot of your own karma. And there's no one to blame. So there is no good karma or bad karma, but our mind makes it good or bad. Human beings are really predictable. We really want to avoid suffering and we want to get happiness. We have three major instinct groups. Creativity, including procreation. Maintenance or durability. We want to keep things. And the other is we want to destroy or recycle certain things. These three instinct groups are so important that the Indians put three deities, Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva next to them. So whatever serves these three instinct groups of ours, we call that good. If it serves procreation, possession, survival, we call that good. Anything that hurts these instinct groups, we call that bad. So you see how human mind makes something out of phenomena. We do that in our consciousness. If we perceive cause and effect, then we can really help others and ourselves at the same time. If not, we feel lost. We feel that karma is destiny, that we actually have no choice. If your mind is clear, you have a path. If your mind is tied and unclear, you feel you have a destiny. Big difference. 
So if you want to use karma, become clear. That's why we practice. Thank you for your question. I would like to ask you to repeat something I heard you describe about from one end of the stick to the other. The, the eight levels of consciousness? Yes, please. My favorite topics. Oh, it's like uh, going to Baskin Robbins. Yes. You know, okay. <laughs> Dharma is sweet, so. <laughs> in Mahayana, we actually describe the human being as body and mind together. And this continuum, this psychophysical continuum, has eight levels of consciousness. As per Mahayana Buddhism, you find more or less in other systems. We do not claim to have the only correct description, but the one that is in the compass of Zen, as the mind only and karma description, I find this supremely practical, simple and useful. So we have eyes, we can see, we have visual consciousness. We have ears, we can hear, we have auditive consciousness. Thus we have nose, smell, and then we have uh, the touch, the skin, the, the other sense, and then we have thinking, conceptual thinking. This is the sixth. That's where we make concepts. So the first five are relatively simple physical inputs. It's like the keyboard or the mouse or the trackpad or a pen for your computer. But the sixth is your CPU. That's where you have your words and your phenomena actually connected. Your sixth consciousness calls this a stick and actually associates a shape like this with the word stick. Your seventh consciousness is the duality maker. When it functions well, you make correct distinctions. When it does not function correctly, you make judgments. When it underperforms, then you cannot tell right from wrong, dirty from clean. So the seventh consciousness calls this short or long. The seventh is the duality maker. And what is the first duality that we experience as a child? Is that this is mom and that's the rest of the world. We don't even know about ourselves at that time. And then we have more and more input into our psychophysical being, and then the notion of self forms. And it's inevitable that we have a sense of personality, and then before long we have a huge wall of ego around ourselves, and then we just want to divide and conquer because we feel that that's what we are compelled to do, especially as a teenager. So the seventh consciousness makes polarities, makes good and bad. That's when we eat from that particular tree in the Garden of Eden, because your conceptual knowledge, the snake, actually advised you to make dualities, because you have the tools, you have the ways and means, and you want to survive, you want to procreate, and you want to possess, and that's why we have dualistic thinking. And the stronger the dualities are, the stronger these instinct groups are. Look at that. And the eighth is your hard drive. It's your memory. Everything that you have ever polarized as good or bad, right or wrong, me or someone else, hope or fear, in any kind of quality you store in your hard drive. That's your memory. When the memory spontaneously functions, it uses the polarity and uses the conceptuality, and then you remember everything that you need to remember. When it's above that, when it's over-function or hyper-function, then you remember too much. Then your memory is always overflowing you. Then you cannot even see clearly or hear clearly because your memory is just dumping you with data. That is not really necessary, but your sense of self, the seventh, is saying, I'm right. I have to remember. I have to prove myself. I have to say something. I have to do something. It's all I, 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 I. The imbalance of the sixth, the seventh, and the eighth is the very root of many mental illnesses. 
Why? We identify with these. And our identification is the problem, not the memory, not the distinction, not the conceptualization, not the five physical sensations. It's not the problem. The identification is the problem. That you say, this is me or this is not me. The negative identification is also a problem. Okay? Body is the hardware. Mind or soul is the software. In Zen, we are looking for the operator. So the operator is your true nature. This original mind, which has no time, no space, no name, no form, no life, no death, no appearance, no disappearance, which is clear like space, clear like a mirror, that's not in any of the eight, but it perceives the eight. It actually operates it. That's our practice. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Just wanted to ask about some conceptions about Zen. For example, em the idea of emptiness, the conceptualization of that in the West in particular of being a void or uh, non-thinking or the idea that somehow in Zen what we do is we stop all thinking. You already understand the answer to this. Well, of course, I wanted to hear from you. <laughs> you want to attain emptiness? <laughs> when you hear this sound, you return to don't know. And no form, no emptiness. Only this moment. That is correct mind. Now the West calls this emptiness, and again it's a mistranslation of so many mistranslations because the original Sanskrit word shunyata meant complete emptiness or empty completeness, both ways. And the West, because it was scholars that, who translated it, they had to make a decision. So literally it means emptiness because there's nothing in it. They read the descriptions. And they actually set up an intellectual trap. And this trap is nihilism. Everything is empty. I don't care. I don't exist. I do whatever I want. See the connection? So the self-defense mechanisms of the I actually can become stronger when you state that there is no I at all. If you want to have a correct view, then let's use the Avatamsaka Sutra's essence. And that says that if you want to understand the nature of this universe, then perceive it as created by mind alone. As created. It's better than saying it's originally empty because we can't do anything with the concept. If you practice, your practice experience helps you translate this into a practical meaning so that you don't fall into nihilism, also in, you don't fall into some stupid positivism that things originally are, you know, absolutely as they are. So, at, hun at 180 degrees, it's neither form nor emptiness. If you have any doubts how emptiness operates, you should read Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> it's great teaching. Winnie the Pooh is a Taoist master in disguise, right? So when he visits Rabbit, uh, Rabbit understands that this is a total ruin and devastation of all her reserves of honey and milk because it's Sunday and Pooh will eat everything, everything. So remember the story, I hope. Pooh knocks at Rabbit's door and says, is there anybody home? Nobody. Hello, I'm looking for a rabbit. Is there anybody home? No, nobody. Then Pooh, you know, he, he really doesn't have a Pentium 5. He has something less, you know, as a processor. So, he says, okay, but, you know, nobody cannot say nobody. In order to have this word nobody, we have to have somebody. And then the rest goes on. And this is really important because if you say emptiness, that cannot come from nothing. In order to say emptiness, there has to be something. Even if it's undefined, even if it has no name and no form, it's not nothing. But it's also not something. 
There you have it. So if it's neither form nor emptiness, you're on the right path. Then you can really keep the middle way and keep your mind clear and practice to be a true human being. Okay? Maybe I missed some of what you were just saying, but there's that old part about uh, form is emptiness and emptiness is form. And I always get kind of like a big fog in my head when I read that. Me too. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it took me years to really figure out what was going on, but uh, Zen is not really giving you sutra teaching. So the sutras are understandable when your intuition is actually developed. And you don't have to go to sutra school or you know, special sutra class. And uh, when you get to the intuitive training, what we call Kongan practice, then everything in the realm of sutras becomes very, very clear. I give you an example actually from Tibetan Buddhism. There was a huge debate about the four-liner. It was called a kind of tantric poem. And in the third line, they couldn't decide whether concept should be understood as A or B. And those scholars, they really just couldn't figure it out. And there was a Lama who just finished a three-year, three-month, three-day retreat. He came from the mountain to the same synod, and he looked at it and he says, it's a misprint. Somebody just had the wrong spelling in the word. He corrected it, and then version C was exactly what was necessary. And everybody saw it. But without his intuition, they couldn't have found it out. So, yeah, you can use your logic, your culture, your understanding, but when you read the sutras, it was written from a mind which we haven't attained yet. So the candy is sweet, but the candy factory is not sweet. When you get to the heart and essence of Zen, which is Kongan practice and the derivatives of Kongan practice, then you attain some kind of intuition which you have never seen before. And from that vantage point, these concepts begin to make sense. Not before. So, I really want to thank you sincerely for your attention and your presence tonight. Don's invitation and Will's and Charlene's help for me to get here. And I hope that one day we can practice together, wake up, attain awakening, and save all beings from suffering. Thank you very much.